Okay, and greetings, brethren. Thank you again for joining us for this edition of Shepherd's Voice magazine on YouTube. Why don't we just get started? Uh, hopefully, the title didn't look too ominous or too intriguing on the other on the other spec side of the spectrum, but uh, it's the best title I can come up with for at least for the moment. So let's begin here in First John chapter two, this Epistle of John, First Epistle of John, chapter two, and let's read these. Uh, positive uh, words that John is writing to the brethren. I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his namesake. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write to you, little children, because you have known the Father. I have written to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the wicked one. Now I bolted out a couple of sections here uh, that I want to get back to, but these statements seem declarative, or it's been demonstrably so, when what John is saying when he's writing to them. Yet there's this Greek word in here that is used and translated because, that may indicate John as being uh, casual in that he describes the conditions of the believers that might be true. So it says, it almost looks like, because this, and this is it's almost definitive the way it sounds, and it is, taking away from that, or, or declarative. But it, he's also describing perhaps conditions of what the believers, what the conditions of the believers, what conditions of the believers might be true of them, or are certainly desirable of them. You know, Darren talked about this uh, uh, man of sin, who was afraid of the man of sin, couple of weeks ago, and in second, second Thessalonians describes. So my focus is to broaden that up today, having some, and it, it brought me, you know, the thoughts I was going through my head as I was listening to Darren, uh, brought me to the scriptures, these scriptures here that I just read, believe it or not. So I just want to broaden the understanding or that subject a little bit today while it's on my mind, and it's been on my mind a little bit lately anyway. And we'll look at what First John is teaching us in particular, and also we'll go to Daniel. So what I was saying here, whether it's declarative or demonstratively so of them, having overcome the wicked one, or is it a casual, or is it more casual? What might be true of them, or can be or should be true of them? Perhaps John meant both. Perhaps he meant both. Though for me in either case, just for me in either case as I read this, <clears throat> I think what he means is that whether a declarative, that it's so of you, that the condition of having, if, it's, if it is so of you, that's declarative, that that condition, having overcome the wicked one and others here, that it remains that way. That it remains that they overcome the wicked one. As the scriptures start to seem to indicate as he, as he goes along in his train of thought. And if that condition might be of them, might be, or can be, or should be, that they be encouraged to be this way and have an overcome the wicked one, namely Satan the devil. Now obviously, and I just wanted to put this out there in a general sense, obviously um, not everyone, and perhaps even most everyone who has read these words, it's not true of them at all. He seems to have a particular audience in mind, and after the millions and millions of millions of copies of this letter has gone out, reprinted and printed in Bibles, New Testaments, up to centuries and all over the world, yeah, one cannot read this and say, yes, this is of me. Because who knows? You know, that, well, we know, just, uh, just in practical sense, it's probably most that have ever read this, it's simply not true of them. Because it's just not part of his field of influence, or in John's sphere of vision at the time. We're reading other people's mail, as it's been said. So, I don't know if John knew exactly what their spiritual conditions were, but it's better off to start off positive, don't you think so? It'd be better that you know, rather than if we were to read it and say, "Well, because I sure hope, but somehow I doubt." 
No, he didn't say that. Or for some of you, he just came out with some very positive statements for the brethren to read. So say not like Paul had to do when writing the Galatians, who specifically knew their condition. But we get the sense of both declarative and casual, or might be a true of them, both de declarative or casual, as we go through the subsequent verses down below, as we go through this epistle. All right, a little bit of throat difficulties today. Let's continue on. Verse 15. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Now what is this world he's talking about? What is this world he is, has in mind? What's he thinking about? Is it people or is it nature, health and beauty products? Is it a money thing? What's he talking about? I think we really need to kind of grasp that in terms of what he has. It was, what's the, what about the world is passing away? And maybe the best way to, to kind of capture it is this. It is a moral and spiritual system to draw people away from God. It is not something that is passive. Like that's just the world doing the world things. I just don't want to be a part of that, you can say. But it's just the world doing, no, it's designed to draw people away from God. And it's both a moral and spiritual system it's not just a bunch of statements, but a system. And there are intentions with it. There are intentions in this world system. It is a seductive system that appeals to all people, true believers, professing believers, or atheists, or whatever, and calls for our affection, our participation, and our loyalty. And that is a lot to overcome. Let's just say that. If you overcome the wicked one, you would know this, what I'm just talking about. This would resonate completely, I think. Maybe you have other words to describe it. I'm, I'm certainly open to that. But in either case, in either case, if you have overcome the wicked one, you would know what John is talking about, this world system. Or you're coming to know. Perhaps you're just coming to know. That's okay too. What John means regarding this moral and spiritual system. And then perhaps we can capture the intensity of the, in the immensity, excuse me, of those words that we read earlier. You have overcome the wicked one. You know, brethren, it's a worthwhile exercise to do this. Consider it that it may be you are coming to know or have not fully considered, identified the world and this, what it's doing and its attempts to draw us away from the Father. There is even perhaps a certain deception that's still out there that we believe. We need to consider these things as we examine ourselves. That we may be still, in some ways, deceived by the world. And still under some sway of the wicked one. That's possible. So that our pride and we get ourselves defensive about this. So I want to challenge some certain thoughts because I can see this happening in Christendom or Christian society. So my intent now is to try to capture things I know in Christianity, and I'm speaking in Christianity in general today. This Christianity. Let's just do this. Including Sabbatarian communities. Okay? Let's show signs of not identifying it, not identifying what the world is, what John is talking about. 
and are being deceived by it. I hope I'm not taking away from John's positive words here, but I wanted to start out with his positive words and, and, and see and see that as something that we are ascribed to and aspire to, to have overcome the wicked one, to know that our sins are forgiven, to really capture that in ourselves. And maybe a little challenge exercise today might be worthwhile. But I want to, I see signs more clearly as time goes on of those who are being deceived. Just being by, deceived by the world. Coming under the, and have been under the sway of the wicked one and have not quite escaped that snare yet. So I made some mental notes listening to Darren a couple weeks ago <clears throat> regarding this man of sin, son of perdition, whatever. We want, we want to call it. So let's go to Second Thessalonians and kind of read here. And we'll pick it up here in verse 7. Just to kind of recap these verses. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now is strange will do so until he is taken out of the way. And when the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming, the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, with all unrighteousness, deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this reason God will send them strong delusion, that they should believe they should believe the lie, that they shall... shall <laughs> that they all may be condemned who do not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. All right. Let's just say here in verse 15. Now, actually, we won't go there. We'll revisit that again. So you read this, man of sin. Now, where else is this man of sin spoken of? Well, I think we can go back to Daniel chapter 7 and verse 8. Let's just go there for now and see what and pick it up here. And he's talking about these beasts that come out of the, the great sea. These four beasts that Daniel's just looking at. You can imagine what he was watching. Verse 8, Daniel chapter 7. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong, it had huge iron teeth. It was devouring and breaking into, in pieces and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts, different, just different. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out from the roots. And there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking pompous words. Aish. Aish. You know, perhaps different. I was wondering what he meant by different. But uh, certainly the way he, it looked. But somehow there was something definably different. But it says here that this little horn, which we're going to take here is this man of sin, had eyes of a man. Meaning what is being symbolized, symbolizes here, meaning extreme intelligence probably across the board, probably across the political realm and, and et cetera, and otherwise. Because the other horns did not have eyes. So this horn was special and it was smarter, sharper, and maybe more sinister than the other horns. You know, the question always comes up, where is this man of sin, the son of perdition, it's antichrist. <clears throat> Where does he come from? What city or country? What ethnicity? What religious background? What society come from? It seems to be always comes up in the case of those who want to pontificate on this person and the subject. 
You know, I don't know the answers to those questions. Simply don't. And speculating on it is going to do no good. And maybe do damage. But there is at least, we understand that this horn undermines and replaces three other horns. At least we know that. And we kind of also want to know where this beast comes from in the first place, don't we? Where this little horn comes out. You know, back in the beginning of Daniel chapter 7, this, these four bees come out of the great sea, the Mediterranean Sea. They rise up out of it. Out of the great Mediterranean Sea. And oftentimes that, that has been used at the all oh, this power, this final power, this fourth beast, being the Roman Empire, which is generally agreed and pretty much identifiable as this fourth beast. Because if you look at the Roman Empire, it's surrounded in the Mediterranean Sea. Since this beast comes out of that ocean, we know, as I've read, that this will be a European final power. But that's not exactly right at all. I want to again broaden this up. Because as I said, so then they start fingering Europe where this man of sins come from. And that's a mistake. We don't know any of that. In verse 21, there's some more interpretation coming. As I was watching, the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them. Until the Ancient of Days came, and a judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High, and, then, and the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. Verse 23, Thus he said, The fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all other kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, trample it and break it in pieces. You know this word earth here, it says the whole earth. By accident one time I realized, just by, just by reading, and a lot of things are sometimes by accident when you're reading, when you're reading a lot, by accident things spark. But maybe we think about this scripture. The word earth in Hebrew is difficult in that it can mean anything from the, the word dust, a piece of ground, a district or region, a country or territory, all the way to the whole earth, I think even the whole globe. And that creates some difficulties if we're not careful. As even in Daniel chapter 8 and verse 5, it's talking about the goat, we're not going to turn there, which is Alexander the Great and his armies coming across, and described here by Daniel as coming across the surface of the whole earth. As far as Daniel can see, same word is there, same whole expression, the whole earth. But this is sort of speaking of a region or territory, and a large one at that. It's not speaking of something even larger. When it talks about the whole earth here, it's talking about the whole of the earth, all at the time, you know, the time of the end of all the, say, the developed countries that have been influenced by the Roman Empire. The whole earth, not just Europe, not just that little region, because that beast came out of the sea. It came out of the sea, but that's not where it ends. That's not where that beast power ends. So here, the leader comes out. So it, I just want to make sure in verse 23, just before I go ahead, is different from all the kingdoms, different. Why? It shall devour the whole earth. Not like these other more regional ones. The whole earth. Okay, so again, here the, we understand then, as we can as we move along, that this leader has comes out with some sort of international power, the beast. And I don't know what ethnicity you have, or what country, or some country, some of these countries may not even be exist yet. Some will be gone that we know of today. But he comes with international 
power of some kind. But that's not really, again, the concern that I'm going after today. But the fourth beast is the Roman Empire. We, we know this, as I said before. And this empire influences lives on, continues to influence lives uh, in the world today. It influences you and influences me. I'm the mere fact, uh, as we, we'll just talk as we go along here. It has conquered uh, this, this system, the Roman Empire, still exists today in the, in the developed nations of the world, <laughs> or most of them. It has conquered aggressively or not so aggressively over the centuries, however you want to describe it. It has. And we can see the Roman influence coming to America, all the way over here. So I, I have a quote here, maybe that will help us understand what I'm talking about here. So I say, From Babylon to America, this, this book that we talked about here a few times, that finally able to put together some time ago. But I do want to read something here that might be of use and of help. All right. Just a quote. This guy's from a professor, doctor in history, Dr. Alderetti. He is an expert and a foremost expert in, in the history of Rome. And he was doing a series, and I caught some of it. But what he explains is that, say, for the United States, was largely founded on Roman principles. And some of you read this already, but for the sake of for everyone. He says here, one of the most overt ways in which Rome has shaped the modern world is the area of politics and government. The United States was founded and designed as a deliberate in imitation of the Roman Republic. This is why it possesses such features as a Senate, three branches of government, a system of checks and balances and vetoes, all of which were components of the Roman Republic. Emphasis on citizenship and participatory role of the citizens are based on the Roman paradigm exemplified by the legendary Roman citizen soldier farmer, Cincinnatus. The founding fathers were very steeped, the founding fathers of this nation were very steeped in classical ideas and self-consciously set out to fashion a new Rome. So this is intriguing. And we can see the influence of Roman, I'd say, and particularly in the capital, the Washington capital the influence of Roman architecture. You can go, anyone who's been to Washington, and I've been there at least once or twice, you can see, and see pictures now easily, of all the Roman architecture, influence of the Roman architecture that is still there today. We even see it in stadiums. There's even one, I think, in uh, California, um, Basically, we call it, it's called the Colosseum. And you can know that we heard of and seen pictures of the ruins of the Roman Colosseum. This is where a lot of this inspiration comes from today in the sporting events and all these kinds of things. That's where this, all that comes from. And at the same time, at the same time, we can see that there are, either the founding fathers, uh, because of their experiences, saw the positive attributes of the Roman Republic and that system of government. But it took away the central power of one individual. So by dividing up the powers, instead of having one authoritative um, dictator, which we can see in history just always goes bad, they were able to prevent that by using the Re Roman Republic model. So that's a good thing. Nothing takes away from that. But we need to be careful with this kind of stuff. As the citizens of heaven, of another nation, we need to be careful of these things. And later on in 1 John chapter 5, we know that we are of God in verse 19. And the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. 
to the world itself. You know, this is talking about the world. Under the sway of the wicked one. Then in the next verse, John writes of God's people, what is in opposition to that fact? And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding. Hmm? Understanding that we should have. Understanding of knowing what it is to overcome the wicked one, what his ways are, and all these things. That we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true, and his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. This is an opposition world lies under the sway of the wicked one. So with having said that, maybe it helps to kind of bring it into terms that we can fully more fully understand as we look at this, as we examine ourselves of not being under the sway of the wicked one. That's the trust and hope that I have. That the world is not the natural habitat for the believer. Would you agree to this? It's like a scuba diver has to, it's not the hab natural habitat for me to go underwater very long. And I can stay me under longer if I put a bunch of scuba gear on, which I've never done. I don't think I'd be very comfortable. I don't know how those guys and gals do it. But to go under the water, that's not my natural habitat. Neither is any human's natural habitat. So the world this whole world that we're in right now is not the natural habitat for the believer. If we agree to this, can you agree to this? What I'm saying. Neither is America. Canada. Or anywhere else where we might call free, the free world is the natural habitat for the believer. That is something that is we need to consider. If that's, is that, that can we agree to this? Because when I say this, yet so why do so many Christians across the spectrum, as I've said, in the United States fight and debate and put energy into what they think is preserving America as though it was their habitat? How many times have you heard, or I've heard, or maybe we've said, or believed, one form or the other, that America was founded on Christian or Judeo-Christian principles? Founded. How many times have we heard that? I heard it more times recently, because my ears were kind of perking up more now that I, I came up recently in a conversation. I'm like, oh. And then I hear it in a sermon put out by some major Sabbatarian Church of God group. And this fellow was deeply entrenched in anglo Israelism, which is exact, it's the same version of the same problem. He says, a nation that was built upon Judeo-Christian ethic. And there's other notes I made about his sermon. It was just outrageous, but I'm not going to go there. So founded and built upon are bolded in here. Is this founded and built upon? Brethren, that is simply not true. Legally and biblically, it can be shown. And I know that there's Christian debate circles talking about this. Some may, I might get some blowback on this, that's fine. But it's simply not true. So we're not going to go through some kind of exhaust, exhaust ourselves demonstrating this. But let's ask ourselves a basic question. A basic question. Was it Christ's intention to offer a blueprint for society somewhere at some time in the future to build a nation or an empire around? Is that, was that his intention, such as America? You know, that would contradict volumes of Scripture, volumes of his words, particularly but which we need not go into. We can see a group of society practicing Christian principles 
um, being of much benefit. But it wasn't the benefit of founding a nation, a legal entity, or an empire. That was never the intention on this earth. That was not the intention. So why claim it as though it were true? <clears throat> so the history of these beliefs that America was founded on Christian principles and all these things that surround it. <clears throat> is interesting that interesting to say the least. You know, when you pick up these very people very popular orders, you know, American prophecy books, <clears throat> it's always they put quotes in there from the founding fathers that work in uh, alignment with this argument that somehow America or British Empire, or other nations are, are somehow descendants of Israel and God is blessing them on account of that, which can be proven wrong across the board, but that's, again, we've exhausted a lot of the thought on there. And the book I was reading from earlier takes care of it to the best of my ability. And maybe one quote that's often used is by Andrew Jackson, the Bible is the rock on which our republic rests. You know, then that makes, must make it a fact, right? No, it does not make it a fact. But it's easy to quote these guys if it works in favor of your narrative. Say on the contrary, and here's an example, and hopefully I can say this properly, because this is going back to some older language in old English. But, but James Madison, he was the chief architect of the U.S. Constitution. Turns out he was very hostile to the idea of Christianity being part of the government. He made some comments here in 1785. Experience witnesses that the ecclesiastical establishments, instead of maintaining purity and efficacy of religion, have had a contrary operation. So he's got some experience in what he's talking about here. During almost 15 centuries, during almost 15 centuries has the legal establishment of Christianity been on trial. The legal establishment of Christianity. In other words, making it the basis of government. What has been its fruits, he says? More or less in all places, pride and indolence in the clergy Ignorance and servility in the lady. And both superstition, bigotry, and persecution. All across the board, he was just saying, this is just, it, it just becomes a mess. So it's not a straightforward argument, let's say, as Andrew Jackson is suggesting. Because what he's saying there isn't exactly true. Because the Constitution itself, most of us probably know, makes no reference to God or Jesus Christ, or the Bible. And there's been attempts made in history to amend that Constitution, to incorporate that in there, but they've always failed. Even Abraham Lincoln ignored the, the, re the request during the Civil War that there was a, um, a proclamation or something to go about trying to do this. And all the other things that have been posted uh, recently this year, these proclamations, it's not in the Constitution. It's simply not there. And I think the Constitution prohibits such an amendment because it says freedom of religion. And that, by definition, says it's not a Christian country. And when you say it's freedom of religion, Judeo-Christian values, I mean, even if the Judeo-Christian, if you look at the Judeo values alone, prohibits foreign religions. <laughs> so how do, we, how do we get around that? But Christian thought has been a very positive influence in the West. But it's not its foundations. It's not its foundations. And that's clearly evident as history shows. You know, it is, we're going to take a little historical exercise here briefly. Uh, we're going to look at the influence of, say, Christianity and uh, this idea, sorry, in Christianity today, where this comes from, that, you know, this 
a more recent, it's actually more recent to consider that America was founded on Christian principles. It's actually a much more recent development than one might think. So I want to read from a um, couple of sections, or not sections, a couple of portions about a book I have here. I've been about halfway through it. It's called One Nation Under God, and it's a, a little bit of a heavy read. Yeah, but it's by this, this gentleman named Kevin Cruz, and Kevin Cruz is a professor of history at the Princeton University. So I think I've read just about half of it and uh, made some notes and things of that nature, the things that I see that are helpful. But let's read maybe just to help us here a little bit and understand the content of this book and what he presents, which is very compelling, to say the least. He's got, he really covers it very well. And this, the, the captain in the back of the book is sometimes, these are handy because you want to read what a book's about. You know, you go in the inside covers or the back. <clears throat> We're often told the United States is, was, and always has been a Christian nation. But in One Nation Under God, historian Kevin Cruz reveals that the belief that America is fundamentally and formally Christian originated in the 1930s. How about that? To fight the slavery of FDRs, Franklin Roosevelt's, New Deal, because he was bringing about this New Deal at the time, which we will get into. Uh, businessmen and enlisted en, en religious activists in, in a campaign for freedom under God. So they felt their freedoms were being threatened by uh, FDR's New Deal. That culminated in the election of their ally, Dwight Eisenhower, in 1952. The new president revolutionized the role of religion in American politics. He inaugurated new traditions like the National Prayer Breakfast. The Congress added, as, as, Congre <clears throat> as Congress added the phrase, quote unquote, under God, to the Pledge of Allegiance and made in, made in God We Trust the country's most first official motto. So one nation under God is the under, one nation, the, the phrase under God was not in the original Pledge of Allegiance. Now, until the 1950s, this occurred with all this religious uh, revolution or movement that was picking up. Church membership soon soared to an all-time high of 69%. It was 20% well before that. Americans across the religious and political spectrum agreed that their country was, quote-unquote, one nation under God. Provocative and authoritative... One Nation Under God, this book here, reveals how un, an unholy alliance, a, alliance of money, religion, and politics create a false origin story that continues to define and divide America politics to this day. Wow. Isn't that interesting? And I found so far this book to be quite an interesting read. There's a quote here in the front from the New Republic, it says here, and describing the book, a deftly detailed history of Christian Christianity service to capitalism in the United States. And perhaps there's something here, and we can look at here and in, inside the inside the covers, what I maybe have highlighted. If I can get us there. He says, like like much of corporate America, the advertising industry discovered religion as a means of professional salvation in the aftermath of the Great Depression. So this goes on and on and on and on. But it is a good read for us to consider. And so what I've realized, and I'll just put this book aside here, in reading this and from my own, just reading scripture and from my own experience, it's like, when you read this and read this book, it's like the Christians' Christians' own beliefs, their own beliefs, in a wide scale have been used to manipulate them, manipulate them themselves. Their own belief system has been used to manipulate them over and over and over again. And that's really no surprise, is it, when you consider that the wicked one, Satan, tried to tried it on Christ using scripture. This is what he did. He even offered, Satan is quite, quite frankly, often in America, he took him in the uh, exceedingly high place and said, 
Are these nations I'll give you? Or it's just, just the ones that exist at the time? The Roman Empire existed at the time. So these nations I'll give you if you just bow down to me. And so Jesus Christ rejected all that. He's already rejected all this. He's rejected worldly power. So I talk about in more detail on all these in the, in the, in the book. So it's not surprising what, what's going on here and what we discuss here. It's just not, shouldn't be surprising to us at all. And a number of religious movements come out on those conditions in the 1930s with the threat of communism and other ideas. And there's a lot of church growth that occurred. Primarily in the 30s, and some of you might be familiar with this, even with the Sabbatarian. That basically used the same type of principles. So movements come out of there. So returning back to God's or John's words, as I started off reading from the beginning, in light of what I just talked about, do we perhaps see the depth of the importance of what he said, what John said? I have written to you, young man, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the wicked one. Is this definitive of you and declarative of you, or is it might be of you? Or is it not of us? Is it not of you? Consider Satan's influence, like these, this author is talking about here. He doesn't say this, but I can see it. And I trust you can too. Because as we describe the world, it is a deceptive, seductive system that demands our loyalty and our energy. And how, how I put it there earlier, go back there and look at it. See how seductive and deceptive it is, even if it's considered for good. And he's just, as John says, you know, we know we know of we only know we're of God. Because the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. So the depth of the deception, the sway of the wicked one, is quite daunting when you consider it. As we read there in Second Thessalonians. And there in verse 7, the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. It's been going on for a long time. Maybe it got ramped up in the 30s. I don't know. It doesn't really matter. But what you believe matters. Because all lies, as I said before, have elements of bondage. And we don't want to be under bondage. Because Jesus Christ came to set us free from the stuff. To being influenced, being used by capitalism. And as I say, it was the capitalism is some inherent evil, buying and selling and do all these things. It's not the, that's not the point. But are you going to be manipulated by it for its purposes? You've got to make those decisions and understand them. So, and say in the spirit of 2 Corinthians, in the spirit of what Paul said, chapter 13 and verse 5 and 6, Examine yourselves to see whether you're of the faith. <laughs> that seems fair. That seems wow. <laughs> Test yourselves, or do you not realize that this about yourself, that Jesus Christ is in you? Can we not, you know, is there, you test to make sure that that is the case, maybe is what he's saying. Unless indeed you fail to meet the test. That's a fair thing. You know, why don't we test ourselves? Why don't we ask ourselves these, these questions? You know, because Paul wrote of this, Man of lawlessness will come with great deception and lying wonders. Are we going to believe that stuff or not? Are we going to believe this? You know, one might think, I don't sure all this plays out, but one might think all Christians should recognize such a person in advance, but not so fast. Not so fast at all. We need to see the mystery of lawlessness already at work. That's my point. And we're not supposed to be participating in it in that regard. There should be nothing new when this man of sin emerges. Okay, uh, he epitomizes the same stuff. Nothing new to those uh, who know this world and know their 
natural environment. We live in this world, but no, it's not their natural environment to know this. Nothing new to those who are, uh, are not under the sway of the, of the wicked one. Nothing new. So we have seen, and you can research all this yourself, just don't rely on what I'm saying, <laughs> that the Christian use of, say, Christian nationalist and nationalist ideas, which is permeated as particularly the churches of God, which we've seen, which is why I wrote this book earlier, as I referenced, how damaging nationalism is. That's the problem, especially how it's ramped up in the America in the 30s. It's a mystery. It's a big mystery. But Satan is using casual beliefs in Christianity to serve his purpose. You don't want to participate in that, do you? We don't want to participate in these things. But let's even take that challenge a little further. Let's take it a little further than one might expect. We can take a recent case in American politics, for example, of how casual or domesticated Christianity is, I like to put it, across the spectrum, across the spectrum once again, who have demonstrated of becoming prey to the world's system under the sway of the beast power, under the sway of a leader. Because we ask the question, well, who be deceived by such a man? You know, how, how can Christians be deceived like this? Who can be deceived by such a man? There was a, an opinion contrib contributor to the USA Today. His name is Ed Stetzer. Is that putting it right? He is a dean and professor at Wheaton College, just down the road. Just down the road here in Illinois, where he also leads the Wheaton College Billy Graham Center. And Billy Graham, by the way, was very much a part of what goes on, went on in there, in the discussions there in the 40s and 50s. Now he elevated in status under, under that same program. But he, this fellow, wrote some insightful comments I'm going to share with you today. He says here, I think this is a subtitle, we must live up to our calling as evangelicals. And evangelicals are really bigger prominent in this, and it showed the conflict with evangelicals and Catholics and all these things, but interesting history. But he says here, we must live up to our calling as evangelicals to proclaim Jesus Christ to the world rather than betray him to sustain worldly power. That's good. I like what he says. In fact, if I'm not mistaken, my next-door neighbor, he, well, he works there in the same college, in religious studies. He's the dean, I guess he's his boss. And new neighbors, very nice people. Um, he also writes, tempted by power and trapped within a culture of war theology, culture war theology, too many evangelicals tied their fate to a man who embodied neither their faith nor their vision of political character. Who would that be? Well, Donald Trump. And we watch that in real time. It's interesting, this culture war theology, as I kind of highlight to myself. Because during 2016, plus or minus a couple of years, I saw several people on my Church of God feed there and uh, on Facebook, some Sabbatarian people I know get behind him on social media sites, just getting in there and posting things, getting behind him. Entering this culture war theology, going to war. And you can see the national, nationalistic attitudes coming out. And the conspiracy theories, as we've talked about here before, is coming out all over the place. And the demonization of political figures and healthcare people, namely demonizing Dr. Fauci, things of that nature. 
is that our calling? Is this, do, you see, do you recognize this as I say all these things? And I'm, I'm watching this in real time. There's people I know are passionate believers, and yet they're getting involved in this stuff, throwing their support behind this man for whatever reasons, just as this fellow points, it points out. This column writer. And I know of a case of a family going, I know them personally, going to the January 6th rally. And I look at this and like, why did you do this? Why did you go all the way over there just for this? Many evangelical leaders invested money and time and convictions towards the promise of Trump because he made these promises. It doesn't matter what your political meanings are and how you feel about Trump. I'm just telling you, we watch, I was watching this in real time back then. And it exposes something. Because whether you're going to the January 6th rally, you're posting things, or as this evangelical found it, found himself fooled. Because we see the results of what happened. Not just by this, but a number of other things, the fallout of denying the election results and fighting this thing. The hostile words. But the mistake is looking to a man to preserve certain freedoms and values. A political figure to do this. That's a mistake. Overlooking all these telltale signs that, you know, some begrudgingly would support him. But that's still a mistake. They should have known. And hopefully now they know, as this writer was talking about, they've been fooled by this thing. By this man, his dogma, and his whatever is going on. But what this demonstrates is not having overcome the wicked one. Because the wicked one empowers this man of sin. But it's what it demonstrates. And I think it's pretty clear. And so we have to take an honest look at ourselves. We look back at some of those times. Who were you listening to? Were you getting behind some of these ministries? Reposting and posting things like this? You know, one would say, well, we still be able to see the man of a mile away. He won't fool me. Well, you know, we just see the precursors of it. And by no means do I think, you know, Donald Trump is some sort of type of man of sin. I don't believe that at all. I'm just looking at the behaviors of people who threw their confidences behind a political leader, thinking that they're going to preserve he or his administration or others are going to preserve what they believe is America being in their natural environment. If you're called out, you're called out. We're going to be the called out of this world or we're not. We've got to follow that calling. So this vulnerability we detected in those who believe America or any other nation was founded on Christian principles. If you believe that, you're going to fight for that. And you're going to find ways of finding power to fight that fight and get into this culture war theology. And as this writer points out, it's a betrayal of him. It's a betrayal. Or believe that somehow partnership with God and spreading the gospel or America is Israel, that leaves people vulnerable. And I don't want to be manipulated into serving um, some beast power in that respect. I pay taxes, you pay taxes, and we live in, a, in this society here, you know, in general, say, North America. We have freedoms and things like that, which we all appreciate. But it's still not our natural environment. That's my point. So we can argue about the good and bad and all these things. And a lot of, a lot of preachers talk about 
I just, I just, the earlier sermon I mentioned earlier, which I didn't mention this part, you know, he says, looking at all the blessings we have here and then pointing out to the Gentile nations about how they behave and, and what's wrong with them and we should have been an example to them and all these kinds of things. Makes no sense at all. If we want to set an example, that's another story. But I don't want to see that vulnerability in people. Because I can see the depth of the deception that is going on if we take the time to be cognizant of these things. In John chapter 16, verse 33, Jesus Christ said, These things I have spoken to you, that you may be, have, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Peace, in that the battle has already been won. There's no need to get into the social wars, the theological, as I was put here, the culture war theology. We don't have to get into these culture wars. Be wise as wolves and innocent as sheep. Do it as necessary. But don't become vulnerable. And don't be fooled. So peace in that the battle is already won. I have overcome the world. And no need to get in that culture war theology. So many ministries have over the decades you want to call them that, get into. So with that, let's just go back to the original words I spoke. Is it of us? Is it definitive of us, of us brethren? You know, I just want to make it generic here. I write to you because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the wicked one. So with that, brethren, I'm going to sign off and uh, close out for today. I hope this message was a blessing to you. Perhaps it was challenging. It's also challenging for me in preparing these things. But uh, thank you for joining us. Be sure to drop a comment. Or send us an email. Appreciate that all the time. And if you find this helpful to you. Perhaps somebody else would have find it helpful as well. Do share. So once again, signing off. Thank you for joining us here on Shepherd's Voice magazine, and uh, we'll see you here next time. Take care.